You're listening to episode three of The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. In this episode of our multi-part series, Gypsy Rose tells me about her life locked inside a different kind of prison than the one I'm going to talk to her in today. Now, here's a quick recap to catch you up with what we've covered so far. When sheriff's deputies found Dee Dee Blanchard's body, face down in a pool of blood, her daughter Gypsy was nowhere to be found. An all-points bulletin was sent out to find the person that had stabbed Dee Dee and apparently kidnapped Gypsy. Now, Gypsy was said to be paralyzed, fighting multiple diseases, including cancer. But 72 hours later, Gypsy was found alive, and it made headlines all over the globe. Gypsy Blanchard was found safe shortly after 10 this morning in another state. Gypsy was found in her boyfriend's house in Wisconsin, 600 miles and three states away from her home in Springfield, Missouri. After a brief standoff, Nicholas Godijan was in custody. He was charged with the first-degree murder of Dee Dee Blanchard. Then, deputies escorted Gypsy out. And that was a shocker for everyone because she was walking on her own two feet. Now, Gypsy's father, Rod, could not believe his eyes. He thought his daughter was paralyzed for life, just like everyone else did. I was so happy to see her walk. It was weird. I was happy. I was mad. I had so many different emotions. But that was only one shock. The aftershock that came next threw her father and everyone else for a loop. Gypsy wasn't kidnapped, not even close. She was, in fact, the prime suspect. They got her in handcuffs. I'm like, she's walking. Wow. What is going on? And then they start, you know, the story kind of unravels about her boyfriend and this and that. It didn't take long for me to realize that, you know, if she can walk, what else has been a lie all these years, you know? Well, he's right. If that was a lie, what else has been a lie? Those answers were going to come fast and furious. Now, I say answers plural because what else was a lie? Well, the answer to that question is just about everything. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm-fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. Dee Dee Blanchard was a pathological liar who suffered from something that's commonly referred to as Munchausen syndrome by proxy or factitious disorder imposed upon another. I've said already that many people regard this as a mental illness, including the American Psychiatric Association, but I disagree. So I'm telling you, I'm probably in the minority. The majority thinks it's a mental illness. I think it is just a form of severe abuse. But what we're talking about here, whatever you categorize it in, is someone who gets another person sick. They either cause them to be sick, cause them to be injured, or present them as sick or injured. One way or another, that person that they have control of is either induced to be injured or ill or presented to others as injured or ill. And sometimes it appears that they do it without any form of gain whatsoever. In this case, there was plenty of gain. This was abuse for cash. This was abuse for secondary gain in the form of money. This was her daughter being a cash cow. And there are no two ways about it. What Dee Dee did to Gypsy was absolutely horrific. Child abuse are just not big enough words for what she did to this young woman. 
Dee Dee Blanchard had what I believe was one of the worst cases of Munchausen's that I've seen, and I've been in this field for 45 years. She brainwashed her. She drugged her. She coerced her into presenting as though she was paralyzed from muscular dystrophy. And she made it seem so real by forcing her to take strong drugs for illnesses she never even had, such as epilepsy and cancer, drugs that mimic the symptoms of the very diseases Dee Dee was telling the world Gypsy suffered from. Here's the problem. Gypsy was caught in a perfect storm of bad circumstances, bad psyche, and a greedy, sick, pathological mother, and all against the backdrop of a system that failed her miserably. And what made it all the worse is that her mother had just enough medical training to be dangerous. And this is common in Munchausen by proxy situations. The perpetrator often has some history in the medical field. They've either worked in a doctor's office or they have some medical training as a nurse's aide or a nurse or a physician's assistant. They know the lingo. They know the symptoms. They know how to talk to the doctors in a way that gives them credibility, gives them validity. And that's exactly what Dee Dee did here. She had worked as a nurse's aide. And we later find out she had acquired books. She had gotten information that told her, these are the symptoms. If if I want to convince a doctor that she has leukemia, we found that she had a book. These are the symptoms that you have if you have leukemia. And she knew what side effects you would have from a medication. If you took it and didn't need it, it would cause certain side effects. And those side effects would mimic a disease she would tell the doctor Gypsy had. So this was very well thought out. And you can imagine the fact that this went on for over 20 years. She had a lot of practice at this. She had a lot of time to get this act down. Now, did Gypsy know that she didn't have all these diseases? Did she know that she could walk? Yes and no. Did she know she didn't have these diseases? She had no way of knowing. She started doing this to her daughter when she was three months old. She said she had sleep apnea. Three months old, she knows nothing. At four, five, six, and seven, a child only knows what they're told. And Gypsy never had a chance to compare this to normal. We often say she could get up and walk and often did when her mother wasn't around. But you have to understand her mother has mind control over her. She threatens her, punishes her, and controls her in every way. Gypsy finally got to the point where you reach a certain age, there's a natural tendency to start breaking away from your parents. And she did get to the point where she said she had all she could take. She says she had had enough of the daily torture. And so she said she took matters into her own hands and recruited her boyfriend to kill her mother. Now, of course, you're going to think, well, now, wait a minute. Weren't there a lot of stops on the subway short of killing her mother? Why didn't she tell somebody? Why didn't she say something and speak up with the doctors? And doctors did see through this facade more than once, but they didn't do anything about it. The worst thing that can happen to someone's being abused is for it to be discovered by someone in power, and then they hand you right back to the abuser. It's very possible to just get what we refer to sometimes as learned helplessness, that you just get a perceptual set that says, there's nothing I can do. The doctors aren't going to help me. CPS had been called. They never did anything. Every time they got in the know, nothing changed. Nothing happened. And her mindset, as you will hear when I talk to her, is that nobody was going to help her but herself. This wasn't her first choice because she did try to escape on more than one or two attempts. After more than one doctor discovered her circumstance, did he follow up, call the police or child protective services? Probably, because he's a mandated reporter. But we really don't know what happened. What we do know is no one is helping her. They left her right there with Dee Dee. She knew if she was ever going to be saved, it would be her that would do the saving. So was this the perfect storm that sealed her mother's fate? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself what you would have done. In order to do that, you have to put yourself in Gypsy's position. And I know that's difficult to do. Sometimes we'll see children that say horrible racist things and their parents are horrible racist. Maybe their parents are KKK. And you think, how could that child say that? But then when you look at their background, it's all they've ever known. 
no one has ever told them there's an alternative. The people they look up to say, this is just how it is. This is what you think. This is what you feel. This is what you believe. And so to condemn the child without taking into account what they have been exposed to is really unfair to the child. And that's why you have to put yourself in Gypsy's position. Psychologically, you have to look at her programming. What was her programming all of her life? She was isolated all of her life. She was tortured all of her life. She was codependent on her mother all of her life. She was controlled all of her life. When she tried to escape, she was chained to a bed. She was threatened. She was starved. Her mother threatened her with a hammer. This was a child that knew nothing except mother being in control. We're going to have to keep that in mind, and in no way... Am I trying to justify vigilante justice or hacking someone to death? But in order to understand what's going on, you have to look at it through the eyes of the abused and consider what they were thinking about at the time. And if your first question is, why didn't she do A, B, or C? The answer is, she did A, she did B, she did C, and the system failed her miserably. We're going to talk to Gypsy. In order to do that, I'm going to ask you to take a walk with me to a place that you do not want to go, and it's a women's prison in Missouri. Look, I've been in prisons countless times in my four decades as a forensic psychologist working in the legal system, and every time I go inside, it is always hard not to feel a sense of despair and even intimidation. Trust me, when we pass through the 20-foot high double fencing topped with razor wire, my heart still skips a beat. The moment we're buzzed inside the cell block, the iron door slams shut behind us. And the inmates know that chilling sound means that their lives are no longer their own from this point forward. I know I get to leave in a little while. They know they've just lost control of their life. And maybe they should. Everywhere we look, we see the institutional colors of prison. It's always dull. It's a dull mix of beige, army green, cinder block walls. The beds, you hear about club fed or women's prisons are different for women. Look, these beds are nothing to write home about. The inmates sleep on cots, and they're either in six by nine cells or they're in pods where five or six women are in a small area together. And the Chillicothe Correctional Center is a fairly new prison, and it is spotless. The warden does a great job. This is a conscientious and caring warden, and he does a great job of keeping the women in his charge as safe as possible. But don't be fooled for one minute. A prison is a prison, and there are dangerous women in this prison, and you don't want to be running into these women in a dark alley or turn your back on some of them. Some of these cons are the worst of the worst. Gangsters, arm robbers, drug dealers, murderers. And Gypsy Rose is right there among them. She's four feet, 11 inches tall, and she doesn't look like she could hurt a fly. But she did. She was said to have had a mental age of six or seven, but yet she says she is the one that planned this whole thing. She's the one that got all the materials together. She got the knife. She got the gloves. She got the duct tape. She got the clothes to him when he first met them at the movie. She made all the arrangements. She put everything in order. So that seems resourceful. How are you? Dr. Phil. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. We're here today so you can meet her and listen to her very first exclusive interview from behind bars. And you're going to get to know her and you're going to learn her feelings about why she did what she did and how she feels about being where she is. And as I say, I want you to keep in mind as you listen to this, is there an argument that maybe there's some mitigation here for what she did because she was a victim as well as a perpetrator? I'll leave that up to you. But I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. Now, I want to comment. You're going to hear her voice, and it's pretty squeaky and pretty small. And it may seem like she's trying to sound childlike. I didn't get that impression. She's had her salivary glands removed. She's had surgery on her esophagus. I think she has been infantilized, so she does function 
at a younger age than she actually is. But I think some of this is physical. But I just have to tell you, this is one of the most revealing and heartbreaking interviews I've ever done. And it starts right now. Gypsy, thanks for talking to me. You say you're a little nervous? A little bit. Tell me why. Um, meeting you. Yeah? yeah? It's exciting. So exciting is different than nervous. I guess they're kind of the same. I guess. Did you want to do this today? Did you want to talk yes. to me? Yes, Tell sir. me why. Um, I wanted a chance to explain my life to you and hopefully maybe get some good advice from you and really tell people how I'm doing now okay. as opposed to back then. As I'm looking at Gypsy Rose, I'm struck at how healthy and vibrant Gypsy is today compared to how she looked in the pictures that you may have seen in the media or that you've seen on our website. Because there, she certainly looked ill. She certainly looked slight. Her head was shaved, her teeth were gone. She was hunched over. She was just a slight young woman with a shaved head. So she looked like she did have cancer. And holes in her mouth from missing teeth. And it, I know it's an odd thing to say, but she seems to be thriving behind bars. And her hair's grown out. She's eating three square meals a day. She's gained nearly 30 pounds. And she's actually a very attractive young woman. And she's serving a 10-year sentence after she sensationally walked into court and cut a plea deal. And you think thriving here, that doesn't seem so odd when you realize for the first time in her life, nobody's pumping poison into her stomach through a feeding tube. Nobody's subjecting her to unnecessary surgeries. Nobody's over medicating her. Nobody's doing anything to make her look on the verge of death. They're just leaving her alone and letting her body repair itself. So she really is thriving because of what is not being done to her. How do you plead to the Class A felony of murder in the second degree? Guilty. Do you belong here? Should you be in this prison? To be honest, I have complicated feelings about that. I believe firmly that no matter what, murder is not okay. But at the same time, I don't believe I deserve as many years as I got. Mm -hmm. But your mother is dead. She is, yes. And she was murdered. Yes, sir. And you were involved. I was. And But for you initiating the sequence of events, she would still be alive. Yes, sir. So in that sense, you are responsible for her death. Yes, sir. And that's why you took the plea deal, right? Yes, sir. What would be a just punishment? For... I'm not really certain on that. I do believe that I do deserve to spend some time in prison mm -hmm. for that crime. Um, but also, I understand why it happened. And I don't believe that I'm in the right place to get the help that I need. Are you glad your mother's dead? No, no, sir. I'm glad that I'm out of that situation. Um, but I'm not, I'm not happy she's dead. Why did you want your mother dead at the time? At the time, I knew that I was being abused, but I didn't know exactly what kind of abuse it was. I just knew that I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things. And my mother was the reason. She would force me to be in a wheelchair and force me to go to doctor's appointments that I didn't need. And I just wanted that life to stop. So what you've just heard Gypsy say is she knew she didn't have to be in a wheelchair to go to these doctor's appointments, but there was nothing she could do about it. Her mother had absolute control over her. She was the jailer, Gypsy was the prisoner, and you do what you're told. And she was told, you get in that wheelchair, you keep your mouth shut. And she rolled her in there. So ultimately, I never wanted her dead. I just wanted that life to stop, that life to be dead, mm -hmm. the life I was living. How many times was she stabbed? That I don't know. You were in the bathroom, correct? Yes, sir. And you could hear her screaming? Yes, sir. So you know that she suffered? I don't like to think about it, but I know... Ultimately, I know that it was painful. At that time, not now, as you sit here now, 
But at that time, did you want her to suffer? No. But Dee Dee did suffer. She suffered until her final breath. It was a death by 17 stab wounds. And I've seen the crime scene pictures. It was brutal and it was bloody. There is no question in my mind that Gypsy did want revenge. And this was vigilante justice. And she appointed herself as judge, jury, and executioner. The question is why? Did she perceive any options whatsoever? And I have to tell you that I've talked to a lot of my colleagues in both the psychological arena and the legal arena. And there are those that have put forth the theory that this was a form of self-defense. Now, Legally, that's generally reserved for situations where your life is in danger at the moment. It's not reserved for someone who's methodically killing you across time. The legal sense says that you would then have opportunities to leave, right? I mean, you would have other solutions. You could pick up the phone and call for help. You could go to the neighbor's house. You could tell a doctor. But there are those that say this was a special circumstance where you have to get into her state of mind from which there was no exit. Those in power had discovered what happened to her and did nothing. Doctors had said, this mother is not a reliable historian. She is making this up. She is making this daughter sick. This is Munchausen's by proxy, and this is just horrid and did nothing. Somebody knew about it because they called Child Protective Services on three different occasions, and they came out and interviewed Dee Dee and Gypsy. They believed Dee Dee when she said she's intellectually challenged and she can't really communicate, so they took her word for it. So again, it's like authorities have been notified, and they've sided with my mother. Nobody's coming to help me. I ran away. She came and got me. Doctors saw what was going on. They didn't help. Child Protective Services came. They didn't take me away. I'm left right here. I don't have alternatives. And based on what she's doing, she is going to kill me. How many more surgeries can I go through? Is she going to start amputating my legs? I mean, is she going to find some quack that's going to, I mean, what's going to happen? They took out her salivary glands for no good reason. And the question comes, how do you find a doctor to do unnecessary surgery? Well, I've already said, you get a mother that does her homework and she presents a symptomatology and she finds a doctor that believes it. And maybe it's not the first doctor or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth, but they doctor hop until they do it because these people are obsessed. They don't stop until they get what they want. And the sicker the child, the more admiration they get because the more of a martyr they become. And so they can't stop. That child has to be sicker. So they are the bigger hero. She would do that if a doctor wouldn't give her the results that she wanted or say what she wanted them to say she would switch to a different doctor. There are those that believe because of what was happening to Gypsy was not immediate and imminent, that it was still self-defense because in her mind, there was no alternative. Now they could have thrown the book at Gypsy. She could have been sent to prison for life, but apparently the court recognized that she was victim as well as perpetrator and sentenced her only to the minimum 10 years because of the mitigating circumstances. But the judge did not buy the self-defense theory because had the judge bought the self-defense theory, he might have just walked her with no penalty whatsoever or put her in a psychiatric facility for a period of time, indeterminate, until she had gotten to a level of adjustment to function outside and let her go. That is not what happened. And I can tell you, having been trained in forensic psychology, you have to answer some questions. Did she know right from wrong? And the answer, apparently, in the court's view, was yes. And did she have the ability to not do what she did? And the answer was yes. That comes down to the difference between the irresistible impulse versus the impulse not resisted. I mean, if it's an irresistible impulse that you had no ability to stop, no break the pump, then that's one situation versus having an impulse that you just choose not to resist. Those are two very different circumstances in the eyes of the court. So I asked her about this, about the fact that the judge didn't buy the self-defense theory. Here's what she said. 
At some level, do you think what you did is justified? No, nothing justifies murder. I think that abuse should be punished by prison. But on one hand, can it be looked at as self-defense? I mean, on one hand, she was dicing you up, girl. How many surgeries did you have? So many. Um, 10, 20? I'm pretty sure 30, because I had multiple eye muscle surgeries, m multiple leg surgeries, multiple throat surgeries. I don't have salivary glands. Not these anymore, because they were removed. Well, you got stabbed, but with a lot sharper knives. You got cut open. You got parts taken out of you. You got hacked up. You got poisoned. You got your childhood was stolen from you. Your adolescence was stolen from you. Your teen years were stolen from you. I'm trying to take the high road. And I found my faith while I've been in here. I've always been a person of religion, but I have to pray to forgive my mother. But right now, the hardest thing is to forgive myself. I have so much guilt. You know, it's a good sign that she says that she has guilt, because that means that you believe that, that she does have empathy. She says she has to pray to forgive her mother, but the hardest thing is to forgive herself. So she does feel guilt. And I want you to go back in your mind for a moment and think about your first childhood memory. Our minds generally record happy occasions as our first memories. But Gypsy's first memory, you have to know that it's anything but happy. What's the earliest thing you remember in your childhood? We all have first memories. What's yours? I think my first memory would be in the hospital. And I remember having a surgery done to my eyes where they had to put a patch over my eyes. That would be my earliest memory. And how old would you have been, you think? Probably like three or four. Do you remember going to school? I've never been to school. Never got to go to kindergarten, pre-K? No, sir. Do you remember playing in the backyard with other children? I played when I was younger with my cousins. Think about that for a moment. She remembers playing outside with her cousins, but then her mother took that away from her. It's actually worse than if she had never been allowed to play outside because she would have had nothing to compare it to. I've often talked to people that have lost their sight compared to people that have never had their sight, and they have a very different reaction to their blindness. And those that had it and lost it it's often more painful for them than those who have never had their sight. Oftentimes, those that have never had their sight will say they don't necessarily want it, whereas those that have had it, it's more painful to have lost it. And here, she had a taste. She has a memory of the wind blowing through her hair and running in the yard and that sort of thing, but then it was snatched away from her, and, and that's very different. And there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is a recorder that really records trauma in our lives. It's just part of the brain that records those things that have hurt us, whether it's psychological, physical, or whatever. It's just like a video audio recorder in our brain that retains those things. And that's why it plays a part in PTSD. And I sit there and think about 30 surgeries and days and days of nausea with poisonous things being pumped into her stomach and her teeth rotting and falling out. And I just wonder if we could plug into her amygdala and project that onto a screen and see what's going on inside her head, how we would feel. I suspect it would scare the hell out of us if we could see what movie was playing in her head. As I got older, I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to have any more friends. You were allowed to have no friends? No friends. Okay, what was your explanation? Because you, you would look out the window and see children playing, right? Mm-hmm. Did you want to go play? I did, I did. Did you say so? I would want to go and play, and I asked mom if I could go play outside, make a friend, and she'd be like, it's too dangerous. You have to stay in here. Um, go play with your Barbie dolls. And so my stuffed animals became my friends. <laughs>
Why were you told it was dangerous? What was dangerous about it? I don't know. I just did as my mom told me to. So you're four or five, and you see children playing outside, you want to go play, and she says, you can't go, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And at four or five, you don't really know what that means, you just know you can't go. Right. Now, at this point, you're walking around the house, running around the house, right? Mm -hmm. Gypsy always did what her mother told her, because she lived by the phrase, mother knows best. She thought her mother was her best friend and always had her back. Now, she thought that because her mother was really, well, she was her only friend. Remember the number one tool of the abuser, I've said it in the first two episodes we were talking about, is isolation. So her mother cut everything from the outside world out of her life. We always tell our children, if you're in trouble, if you're scared, if you're lost, if somebody's bothering you, what do you do? You find an adult, right? And... Who are the adults that you look to in your life that you trust the most? Go to a fireman. A fireman will help you. Go to your mother. Go to your father. And when one of those with that assigned trust and authority violates it, that's the worst of all, isn't it? I mean, it's worse than just some friend betraying you because it's just built in to our value system that if you can't trust your own mother, who can you trust? So we say here, this was not just her best friend. It was her only friend. It's her mother. You figure, you know, your mother's got your back always. But in this case, she used that trust to feather her own nest. Now, here's Gypsy's attorney, Mike Stanfield, and psychiatrist Mark Feldman, who studies Munchausen syndrome. I don't think calling Gypsy's life sheltered would do it justice. Her daughter was, in essence, a hostage. Dee Dee betrayed Gypsy, horribly betrayed her. And like I said, I take no pleasure in speaking ill of someone that's passed, but that woman, I'm sorry. She just was a sorry excuse for a mother. And when you look at everything she did to this innocent child, that's just a sorry excuse for a human being. I'm sorry. I I don't wish her dead. I absolutely do not. I think she should have been held accountable, but not hacked to death. But As I said, I don't think she was mentally ill. I think she was just a terrible abuser. And she's the one who should have been sent to prison for everything she did to Gypsy. But yet, here's Gypsy in prison. She crippled you for years. She kept you in a wheelchair. She kept you on a feeding tube. She got all of these medications that you were on. And good Lord, it's staggering. She had you diagnosed with asthma hypoventilation, epilepsy, hearing and vision impairment, GI reflux, put you on a feeding tube, muscular dystrophy, quadriplegia, mild mental retardation, as she called it, anemia, allergies, leukemia, incontinence, lung disease, heart disease, heart murmur, all of these things. They had you on pages and pages of medications many of which have side effects that mimic the diseases that she said you had. I see. So she's giving you medications that cause some of the the slowing of the nerve impulses, et cetera, that would mimic cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy or some of the diseases that she reported. So... If someone's not suspect, they would go, well, you know, there's a little, I can see where this might be in the early stages or something. It wouldn't be a red flag if they check something. Mm -hmm. You were being set up. These things could cause you to mimic these diseases. Right. Why would she do that to you? I don't know. Well, I know why Dee Dee made Gypsy sick on purpose. We talked about that before, and when you hear the details... It will make your blood boil. We're back with our exclusive interview with Gypsy Rose Blanchard behind bars. Now, she was born Blanchard, but her mother, remember, added an E so she would have a little extra flair to her name. I speculate that's why she did it. Maybe she was hiding from something. I don't know. Think for a minute about how you might be a bit squeamish or even terrified when you go into the hospital for a minor operation. Now imagine how bad it must have been for little Gypsy. In the 24 years she lived with her mother, Dee Dee, Gypsy was literally cut up from dozens of major surgeries, every single one of them unnecessary. And that doesn't count all of the 
pokes and prods and biopsies and blood studies and needles. And if that's not bad enough, now her mother is telling her she has cancer. You had been told you had leukemia, right? Yes, sir. And she said, let's shave your head because it's going to fall out. We'll at least keep it even. Yes, sir. But you now know she wanted you to look like a cancer patient. Yes, sir. Did she warp you? Did she warp your personality? Did she warp your mind? Did she warp your moral compass? In the beginning, yes. And through my life, yes. And I'm trying to change that. She taught me how to be a good liar, a very good liar without any conscience. And I'm changing that. I'm trying to be a good person now. I don't want to be like my mother, and I'm nothing like her. If anything, I tell the truth too much now. (laughs) What this sounds like is that she is a co-conspirator, that her mother had co-opted her, and together they were defrauding people. It's like I say when I'm talking to a child that has been molested in childhood. They feel guilty because they were involved. They feel guilty because they participated in it. They sometimes tell me they feel guilty because there were times that they actually enjoyed it. And so they feel bad and they feel guilty. And I always tell them the same thing. I say, you had zero accountability for what happened to you as a child and 100% responsibility for what you do about it now. So I don't hold Gypsy accountable for what her mother coerced and brainwashed her and controlled her into doing as a child. And she is being held accountable for it now in prison. But do I hold her responsible for not standing up in that doctor's office against this jailer mother that has this psychological power and control over her? No, I don't. I don't think a child has the ability to do that, knowing that she's then going to go home with that woman behind closed doors, and God only knows what's going to happen to her. Now, I know I've explained Munchausen by proxy, but it's pretty hard to wrap your head around So why would Dee Dee do such despicable things to her own flesh and blood? Frankly, we don't know. We don't know what causes Munchausen's by proxy. Even those that consider it a mental illness don't know what's the causation. There doesn't seem to be a big genetic component passed from generation to generation. We just really don't know what the prodromal is, what leads up to it, what triggers it. We just really don't know. It's usually women rather than men, but we don't know what causes it. And it's a real baffling situation because sometimes it happens apparently without any external rewards. That's not a puzzle in this case because there was lots of external rewards here. There was cash, there was attention, there was admiration, there was hero worship. She was a martyr. So there was lots of secondary gain for her here. But whether you consider it mental illness or just an abuser, we really don't know what causes it. And I wish I could tell you more, but we just simply don't know. And I would just be speculating. And I don't think that's in anybody's best interest. What's important is that you look for the signs and know how to spot it when it occurs. She certainly got all different kinds of currency by making her daughter suffer such misery. But the main thing was she was a very greedy woman and she wanted easy money, our money. We have unearthed the appearance of a long financial fraud scheme. That's Jim Arnott, the sheriff in Greene County, Missouri. He says Dee Dee was running a big scam off of Gypsy's fake illnesses. That seems to be an understatement. I mean, do the math. Add up the cost of dozens of surgeries, the expensive medications, the monthly disability checks, and it comes to hundreds of thousands of dollars in government assistance. I mean, it's a six-figure fraud, not too shy from the million-dollar mark. And guess who paid for it? Taxpayers pay for it in spades. The woman ripped off tax dollars to support her scam for nearly a quarter of a century. And that's only what the government shelled out. Dee Dee also duped private charities to give her and Gypsy free vacations, helicopter rides to hospitals for emergencies. She got tens of thousands of dollars in tax-deductible donations from good Samaritans that could ill afford it. I'm sure they just are moved in their heart to give it to her. Did you understand that you being sick was necessary to keep up what she built? I mean, were you getting money for that because you got a a house from Habitat for Humanity? 
you got donations, you got different things from people for being sick. So that was a source of income for her, right? It was, yes. And I had no idea that I was a part of that. You didn't know that you were a cash cow? No. You didn't know that she was converting your illness into sympathy and donations and that sort of thing? No. Why do you think she did this? I ask myself that all the time. I just don't understand how somebody can do this to their child. Their child that they're supposed to protect and love, not use them as a cash cow and use them for their own means. Do you think she loved you? When I was younger, I thought that. And then when I found out the truth, I'm like, I didn't know this woman at all, did I? Everything that she ever told me was a lie. So how can I honestly believe her whenever she told me she loved me? When you realize that this woman takes this innocent, defenseless child, isolates her, the number one tool of the abuser is isolation. To abuse someone, you have to isolate them because they're, they're around friends, family, church members, community members that will step in and go, hey, wait, they, you shouldn't let them do that to you. They can't get away with it. So they have to isolate you. So then they can kind of be in your ear saying, you're not very smart, you're really sick, get in this wheelchair, get on this feeding tube, I'm your mother, trust me, trust me, trust me, don't talk to anybody else, talk to me, listen to me. They program you for it. So that's why I couldn't have any friends. Of course not. Of course not. You might, on impulse, jump out of that chair and run across the field. I wish I would have. And then what happens then? The, somebody that's donated money says, this kid's running across the field. And her whole house of cards comes tumbling down. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Dee Dee started construction of that house of cards when Gypsy was just barely three months old, when she claimed she had sleep apnea and needed to wear a heart monitor at night. See, it's important for her to have paraphernalia. She has to have something other people can see. So if she's wearing a heart monitor or she's on a walker or she's in a wheelchair, then she has these external signs to show people that she's sick. I mean, just to say, you know, my daughter's sick. She has to have the shaved head. She has to be emaciated. She has to have the feeding tube, the walker, the wheelchair, all of those things that look medical because that sells the scam. There's a point at which you got put in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And you were seven years old, correct? Yes, sir. Why did she tell you you were going in the wheelchair? I did get into a motorcycle accident. Uh -huh. And um, it skinned my knee. And um, then she took me to the hospital and then told me that um, the doctor gave her a wheelchair and I have to be in a wheelchair now. Forever? Forever. Did you know that you could walk? I knew that I could feel my legs, and I knew that I could walk, but um, it slowly started being like using a walker. And then after that motorcycle accident, put in the wheelchair. So she just put you in a wheelchair mm -hmm. for a skin knee? Right. Yes, sir. When you sat down in that wheelchair, did you know you could walk when you sat down in that wheelchair? Yes, sir. But you used a wheelchair anyway? Yes, sir. She had me use a walker before the wheelchair. Before the motorcycle accident, mm -hmm. before the wheelchair, she had you using a, a walker. walker. Yes. Why did she tell you you had to be on a walker? She said that I had muscular dystrophy. But did you feel any different the day before you got the walker than the day you did have the walker? No, sir. You were able to run around? Pretty much, yes. You were just normal like you'd always been? Normal, yeah. But then just one day, here you have to start using this walker. Right. Mm -hmm. And would you forget to get it and run into the kitchen? There would be times that I'd forget to grab it and then go to walk. And then my mom would catch me and be like, use your walker. And I'd use the walker. Did you ever ask her why, if you could walk okay, that you needed to use it? No, sir. She just told you you had a disease? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And when you woke up in the morning and got out of bed, did you get up without the walker? No, sir. I used the walker because my mother made me use it every time I went to stand up. Okay. And then the motorcycle accident happens. Mm -hmm. And 
Were you hurt badly or did you just skin your knee? I just skinned my knee. How long were you in that wheelchair? Um, I want to say from 1999 to 2015. Wow, think about it. That's 20 years, more than three quarters of her young life wasted in that wheelchair. And she was with you all the time? Yes, sir. She was with all you every the time. Day. She would push me. She would push you in the wheelchair. Yeah. And did she tell you when you went out that you were to stay in the wheelchair? Yes, sir, she would. And the sad thing is, Gypsy always knew that she could really walk. But her mother convinced her that it was not in her best interest, that she would crush her spine if she got up and walked around. She just couldn't walk around anybody else. And she knew if she did, there would be hell to pay. Could she take the risk? She didn't want to risk her mother's wrath, that's for sure. When she wasn't around, she was in the shower, she was in the bathtub, or she was asleep and you were awake, did you get up and walk secretly? I did, yes, sir. So you would walk around the house when she didn't know it? Yes, sir. But when she got up, she could get back in the chair. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Did she ever catch you walking? She did a couple times. And, and what did she say or do? She got so upset with me, she would punish me so bad. Like she started hitting me with a coat hanger and telling me all kinds of mean things. And she was just so angry at me. What kind of mean things would she say to you? She would tell me that she wished she had an abortion when she had the chance that I ruined her life, that I have no idea how hard it is to keep up everything she built. But then Dee Dee really upped the game. She told the doctors that Gypsy quit eating because she just couldn't digest her food. Now, if she can pull this off, this is a big one. You know, I said she needed this paraphernalia, these medical apparatus around. Dee Dee somehow convinced them to implant a feeding tube. Now, this is not a pleasant procedure, not at all, and not every doctor would buy into this, so she would doctor hop. And this is, again, how the system let her down. She would go to one doctor, he'd say no. She'd go to another doctor, she would say no. She'd go to another doctor until finally she takes her in there and, of course, doesn't feed her, so she looks emaciated. She looks malnourished, and she says, look at her. I mean, she's wasting away because she can't keep anything down. We, I've got to get her nourishment. We've got to have a feeding tube. And finally, somebody worried that if she gets so emaciated and becomes so dehydrated, then her vascular system will collapse and she could be in real danger. So somebody says, well, we better get a feeding tube in there. And now she's got it. And that is very validating. Did she tell you why? I know that I spent about six months in the hospital. Um, and my mother told the doctors that I couldn't eat, that I stopped eating. And so they put a temporary feeding tube in my nose and they wanted something more permanent, so they put a permanent feeding tube in. Just because she said you had quit eating? Yes, sir. Did anybody ask you if you'd quit eating? No, sir. She just told them you had? Yes, sir. And you had dropped some weight? I did drop some weight. How did you drop weight? I really don't know. I know that the medication that I was on was making me nauseous, um, but I could eat just fine. Now listen closely to what Gypsy's about to say. She's so much sharper now, and her use of complex sentences demonstrates she has an intellect that is beyond someone who never made it past sixth grade. And the way you'll notice this is listen to the complexity of her sentences. Listen to the number of words in her sentences. She's supposedly second grade education at the most, and people that are reading at a fifth grade level, they tend to use short sentences and simple words. Listen to the complexities of what she's talking about here. So you go on this feeding tube. Mm -hmm. She fed you through the tube. Yes, sir. And put my medications through the tube as well. Looking back, are you suspect as to what she might have been putting in that tube? It does pique my curiosity because I don't know all the names of the medications that I was on. Could she have been poisoning you in some way to keep you sickly? Could she have been over-medicating you to keep you weak? Could she... It's a possibility. You were diagnosed with epilepsy about this time as well, right? Yes, sir. And so they started giving you Tegretol. Mm-hmm. 
and it caused your teeth to crumble. Yes, sir. Did you know what was happening at the time? No, I really didn't. I just didn't understand why my teeth was crumbling, why my teeth were falling out. I had to have them extracted. I just knew I was losing teeth. Tegretol is a very powerful anti-seizure drug with potential side effects that are much worse than crumbling teeth. Long-term use could cause irreversible liver damage. Now, I'm talking about this if you take the medication when you don't need it. Tegretol is a wonderful medication if you're subject to seizures and you need it, but then it has to be monitored and taken responsibly. It can be a great medication, but if you don't need it, and so it doesn't interact with your body the way that it would if you did need it, you can have problems with side effects, but by Dee Dee's yardstick, that could be a good thing. She had a medicine cabinet full of drugs. You know, let's say she's going in for seizures or whatever, she would give her some the drugs that would make her have the symptoms of whatever she was going in and telling them she had. She put Orogel in her mouth to make the doctors think that her saliva glands were producing too much saliva. She knew the terminology. She knew how to make Gypsy appear to have certain symptoms by giving her certain medications. She was pretty slick. But you know now you didn't have epilepsy. I know now. When you went to see doctors, did she tell you what to say? Did she tell you what not to say? She told me that I couldn't speak during a doctor's appointment, that it would just solely be her. She would tell me, you know, sit in the wheelchair, play with your Barbie dolls, and let me talk, and don't interrupt. This is adult conversation, so children can't get involved in adult conversation. And this continued on even into my 20s, late teens, 20s. She was still telling me that. I was in private practice, and there would never be a time that there would be a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old person in my office that I would not ask them a question. So you had to be asked questions was, directly by the doctor. I was asked like, what how, how I was doing today, and I would say, fine, you know. Um, but there was never a time that the doctor asked me anything about my medical problems. He didn't ask you anything about your medical history or if you were experiencing the symptoms she was reporting to him or her? No, the doctors never asked that because my mother told the doctors that I was mentally incompetent. Therefore, they thought, you know, she won't know what she's talking about. She's got the mind of like a, a child. I mentioned something earlier about learned helplessness. And, you know, this is a concept that was set forth by Martin E. P. Seligman. And learned helplessness is a state of mind where you just can no longer learn that you can be helped. Even if a solution is presented to you, you have long since given up on the hope of anything being able to help you. You've gotten to the point where you just say, I'm here forever. Nothing's ever going to help me. Nobody's ever going to help me. So you stop looking for solutions. And at that point, your data window shuts down. Even if somebody brings you a fix, your mind simply doesn't process it because you've long since given up hope that anything is going to help you. Think about going through 20 out of almost 24 years being cut up, shot up, made sick, controlled and dominated, and nobody helps you even when they know, that very well could be something that she was in and out of or on the brink of. We know that wasn't where she wound up because she did grasp a solution. Therefore, they thought, you know, she won't know what she's talking about. She's got the mind of like a, a child. Did she tell you that? That I had the mind of a child? Uh -huh. Yes. So did she tell you that you were intellectually challenged? Yes, sir. Tell me what she said to you about that. How did she explain that to you? would always use this, um, like a medical term for everything that was wrong and every reason she gave me, she used the medical term. So she used um, that I had microcephaly, which is small head, that my brain didn't develop right and I'm not, I don't have that maturity. I'll never mature past a six-year-old's level. So she tells you that you're limited intellectually. She tells you that you have muscular dystrophy. She tells you that you're not to speak when you go to the doctor. Did you ever say to her, there's nothing wrong with me? 
No. You saw a doctor in New Orleans that did a muscle biopsy on you to check for muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. Now, a muscle biopsy for muscular dystrophy is a very painful procedure. I still have the scar. Yeah, they, they strip muscle from your thigh, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that happening? I remember the day that I went, for, went in for surgery. Um, and I remember having a cut on my leg, on my thigh. Did you ever know what the results were? No, sir. She didn't tell you? No, sir. What do you know now about that? It came back normal. And she knew that? I think that she did know that. Well, he gave her the report. We, we have the report. I mean, you know now that she had the report, that it was normal, so she just quit seeing him. She right. just went away. Mm -hmm. Gypsy says that when the muscular dystrophy test came back normal, her mother was livid. Livid? What sick things are going on in this mother's mind? A normal mother would be ecstatic that her daughter was normal. But we know this isn't a normal mom. So now Dee Dee goes shopping for a new doctor. She takes Gypsy to a well-respected neurologist, Dr. Bernardo Flasherstein, considered to be one of the best nurse specialists in the country. But the good doctor didn't tell Dee Dee what she wanted to hear. In fact, he caught the scammy spider weaving her tangle web of lies. He called her out. He smelled a rat right up front because he knew what he was doing. Now, a lot comes tumbling down at this point, right? Because you do talk to him. He does talk to you. Mm -hmm. He has you stand up, right? Mm -hmm. Where was your mother at this point? She was inside the room. With you? With me. He kind of um, held my hands, and I put some weight on my legs. And I think that gave him the inkling that this girl could walk. This girl is not paralyzed. She has muscle strength. And how did your mother react to that? She did not like him whatsoever. She was like, I'm, I'm not even bringing you back to see him. I'm switching doctors. He wrote, this mother is not a good historian. She's not reporting the history accurately. He says, quote, analyzing all the facts, there's a strong possibility of Munchausen by proxy. So he says, there's a good chance that this mother is making this child sick on purpose for her own reason, her own purpose, her own gain. He wrote that down. He talked to another doctor you had seen before who said, I found nothing wrong with her, the muscular dystrophy test. He writes down, Munchausen's by proxy. This mother is not to be trusted. What happened from that? We switched doctors, and nothing ever came of it. It didn't stop. Nobody said anything. Nothing was done. Nothing was done. Now, can you imagine what Gypsy's singing at this point? I told you that doctors had discovered it and did nothing. This is one of the things that I'm talking about. She thought for a moment, my mom is busted. I mean, I'm saved. So she gets her hopes up and then nothing is done. And I'm not criticizing Dr. Flasherstein here because he's a mandated reporter. All he can do is report it down the line. And then what happens to it after that, he's not policing these things. All he can do is report it. And it went into his file and I have no doubt that he reported this. And she thought for a moment, she's busted. This is where I get so frustrated with the system failing. I cannot believe all of this good diagnostics, all of this was done, and then nothing comes of it. They get into the hands of a top professional. He penetrates this scam. He sees it. He reports it. And then the system just drops the ball. How does that happen? Now, let's go down a hypothetical highway for a minute here. Assume Dee, Dee was still alive. What would she have done by now? I can tell you she was running out of surgeries. So what would she have done next? Would she have found someone to amputate a limb? And you say, well, how would she do that? Would she have used a tourniquet? Would she have cut off circulation until something got in trouble? I mean, who knows? If you have Munchausen syndrome by proxy, you'll find a way. If she was still alive, would Gypsy still have her arms and legs? I don't know. This poor girl was let down so many times. Her mother, the healthcare system, and now she's about to be trampled by a powerful government agency. 
Gypsy Rose thought for a brief moment she could finally break free from her wheelchair prison. This nerve specialist told her she doesn't have muscular dystrophy. She's not paralyzed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her. But he said there's something really wrong with Gypsy's mother. The doc said Dee Dee was making Gypsy sick and doing it on purpose. Just a few days after that doctor's visit, someone called in an anonymous tip to the Missouri Department of Family Services. The tipster said Dee Dee was abusing Gypsy. This tip very likely flowed from her visit to Dr. Fleischerstein. So two caseworkers were soon knocking on Dee Dee's door to check out the claim in person. I don't know who made the call, but they asked me, they wanted to look at my legs to see if I had bruises. And at that time, I didn't think that I was being abused. I didn't understand. There was nothing that made me question my life. So whenever they came to look at my legs, I had no bruises. They dismissed it. They questioned my mother as to why I had different birth years at different hospitals. My mother claimed that she had a head injury from a car accident that we were in in 2001, and they believed her, and they closed the case. When they came to the door and started asking questions, did hope flicker in you that maybe you might be taken away? At that time, I didn't want to be taken away because I loved my mother so much, and at that time, we had a good bond with each other. I wasn't trying to rebel at that time. So at that time, you didn't feel like you were being victimized? Right. So you would have resisted being taken away? Yes, sir. How did your mother respond to that when they came? She was very, very nervous to the point of shaking. Um, she really, really didn't know what to say. Um, she kept digging through her files to try and find a copy of my birth certificate um, that she had forged to make it look like I was younger. She changed the numbers. So instead of 1991, it was 1995. Uh -huh. And they kept questioning her, and she kept getting more nervous. Well, during that brief visit, the social workers didn't find evidence of abuse, so they closed the case. But that brief visit opened up everything for Gypsy. She finally learned the truth about her real age. She was 19, not 15, and that's when she rebelled. When I turned 19, I ran away from home for the first time. But what happened when Dee Dee found her? And believe me, you will be aghast at what that woman did to Gypsy. When a couple of social workers checked out an anonymous report that Dee Dee was abusing Gypsy Rose, she learned that she was 19, not 15. She was very small, so she always believed she was younger. She always knew deep in her mind that she could walk, but her mother had her so afraid it would cause damage, she was afraid to do it. And now she was coming to the realization that her mother lied to her about everything. If she was lying about my age, is she lying about everything? You know now you didn't have muscular dystrophy. I know now. You know now you didn't need to be in that wheelchair. Mm -hmm. You know now she was making all of that up. When did you figure this out? I started having an inkling when I turned 19, and I had made a friend, um, Aaliyah. She was our next door neighbor. And I started wondering, why can't I be like Aaliyah? Why can't I have friends? Why can't I go to the mall with you know friends? Why can't I go outside and meet people? because I would look at her life and her life was so different from mine, so it made me question my life. And pretty soon I found a couple of bits of paper in my mom's safe, things that stated that I was born in 1991, made me question my real age. I asked her about it. She said that it was a typo. And I still, I wanted to be older. And so, I had taken those papers and the Medicaid card that I found with my actual real birthday on it, and I ran away from home. So once she finds out that her mother's lied to her about her age, that really starts her to thinking, and she realizes that she is of age. She realizes, okay, I'm 19 now. I'm not a teenager. I'm not 15. So she starts to feel a little more empowered, let's say. 
I didn't, I didn't get very far because she took me, she found me pretty quickly and took me back home. And boy, was I in a lot of trouble. What happened when you got home? She smashed my laptop. And yes, I did have a laptop for a time. It was to play little games on and stuff. How did she smash it? It was a hammer. Oh, she took a hammer and she took a hammer it. to it. Mm -hmm. And she told me if I was to contact anybody, any of her friends, and tell them that she would take a hammer to my fingers next time. And then she put a bell on the door. So if I tried to run away again, she could hear it. And she, ta she had taken handcuffs and a dog leash and tied it together and tied me to the bed, chained me to the bed. So she handcuffed you mm -hmm. around your hands, your wrists? Mm -hmm. She handcuffed me and tethered it to the bed. So how long were you tied to the bed? About two weeks. The empowerment didn't last long because she's outrageously punished. I mean, two weeks chained up like a wild animal? This is atrocious, and this is why I say you have to realize her point of view. And I know you're shaking your head and saying, how could that woman do that to her own little girl? But this is a watershed moment for Gypsy. Based on her running away, she absolutely knows she's being lied to and manipulated by her mother. She knows she can walk. She knows she can run. She knows her spine doesn't collapse. And she knows mom is not my best friend. She's running away. She's not running to something. She's running away from something. She knows everything she's done. People with Munchausen syndrome by proxy are calculating. And so now she chains her to a bed for two weeks. It just shows the depths of depravity that Dee Dee fell into. So just so she could continue her fraud, just to continue to get attention and money. That's what I mean by saying this to me is just abuse. This is abuse. This is cash driven. And once Gypsy was freed from the chains on the bed, she found another way out of the house, a virtual way out. Because Dee Dee smashed Gypsy's computer, she secretly used her mother's laptop and did something so bold and daring that if her mother ever found out, God knows what would have happened. She was really taking a risk here, which tells me how desperate she was. She was willing to take this risk. I made a secret Facebook account. Right. My mother had one, and I wasn't allowed to have one, but I made one anyway. And I would talk to Leah. I would talk to a few other people um, that I hadn't met in person, but I wanted to make friends. I wanted to reach out and be normal. And I made an online dating profile on a Christian dating website uh -huh. because I started to have feelings of wanting a boyfriend. And that was something that was never allowed. Mm -hmm. Never allowed. And at the time you got on there, was your head shaved at that point? It was. But you go on the dating site and you've got a shaved head. I wore wigs. And it's on this Christian dating site that you meet Nicholas. Yes, sir. We, um, our relationship was about almost three years. How much of it was just talking back and forth on the computer? Um, 99% of it. Now, Gypsy's a pretty resourceful young woman for someone who's been so sheltered and living under her mother's thumb. She wanted to meet Nicholas in person, and she knew she had to be the driver on this. She had to be the one that moved this forward because Nicholas is living in a basement. I mean, he doesn't have a job or anything. So she got several hundred dollars from her mom's safe to buy Nicholas bus fare and some nice clothes. So he soon took the Greyhound from Wisconsin to Springfield. The plan was to rendezvous at the movie theater. I had bought him some nice clothes to wear and sent it to him. I just wanted him to look nice so hopefully he can impress my mother. She didn't know he had come down from Wisconsin? No. And you had told him you were in a wheelchair? Yes, sir. But did you tell him that you could walk? I didn't tell him that until probably the final year of our relationship. What did he say when you said... I'm in a wheelchair, but I can walk. He said that he knew already. He said that he was psychic and that he had these premonitions that I could walk. I know what you're thinking. That sounds pretty weird. 
But it's only going to get more bizarre because Nicholas told Gypsy that he had multiple personalities. He also thought that he was a 500-year-old vampire named Victor. A 500-year-old vampire named Victor. What would you think about that? I was like, oh, okay. I played along, I guess. You didn't believe it? Or did you? I, I, think, I think a part of me did believe it at the time. You did believe he was mm -hmm. a 500-year-old vampire mm -hmm. named Victor living in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. riding a Greyhound bus. <laughs> yes. Now, that sounds pretty ridiculous, of course, because we're looking at this in the rational light of day, and I've never heard of vampires riding on buses. They don't need to, but, of course, I assume this is the first vampire that Gypsy's ever dealt with, so I assume she didn't evaluate it very carefully either. He had multiple personalities. Um, Victor was only one of them. They had others that were much more violent and scary. Such as? Such as, he called him the black one. Um, and that was, he would send me um, video messages online. And he would just talk in this horrible, scary voice. And he would talk about how he wanted to kill me and how he wanted to rape me. And if I didn't do everything, he said that he would come and find me and kill me. And he, and I quote, he said, I will kill you so bad that they will never find your body. But you wanted to meet him. I did. I was in love with the, or thought I was in love with the good side of him. But Gypsy was all in. She says she made up her own alter egos to complement his. There was pretty sexual content to your going back and forth on the internet, right? Yes, sir. He was erotic role-playing and BDSM and all. And you had alter egos as well, right? I made alter egos to fit his. Okay. Like, tell me about Little Kitty. Um, little Kitty was kind of um, a little girl. Uh -huh. and, um, I kind of based her looks off of anime cartoons. And which one did that one counteract or um, go with? It would uh, counteract with um, his little boy personality. And then there was uh, Candy. Mm -hmm. What was that? Candy was more of um, the vixen, more um, risque. And that went with what? That went with his, um, that personality that's more sexual. And then you had an alter ego, Ruby. Mm -hmm. And what about Ruby? Ruby was for Victor. Ruby was for the vampire. Mm -hmm. So Ruby was evil. Ruby was a werewolf, and she was the evil one. So again, Gypsy's thinking in a pretty sophisticated way here. I mean, you look at the structure of the alter egos. Little Kitty was a little girl who went with Godijan's little boy personality. Candy was a sexual vixen invented to go with his sexual personality, and Ruby was the evil werewolf who went with his vampire personality. And by this time, Gypsy knows that she can fully walk with no problem. So she's really starting to think for herself here, and she's getting very creative. Now, it's after this meeting at the movies, did you ask him to kill your mother? No, not at the movie theater. Oh, afterwards. Afterwards? Uh-huh. Yes. We had thought of different ideas. I was getting desperate. Gypsy says her desperation turned into thoughts of murder after she got into a knockdown, dragout argument with her mother over having yet another operation. It was about my feeding tube. Um, I asked her if I could have it removed because I was honest with her. I'm like, I no longer need this feeding tube. Can we please have it removed? And she said, no. And I had an upcoming surgery and I didn't want to have it. So I asked her, please tell the doctor, I don't need this surgery. I've had it 20 times before. Like I know that I've had this surgery before. Why do we have to have it again? And she's like, there's nothing I can do about it. The doctor wants it. And so, I became very numb to plan B. Plan B? 
Well, that sounds sinister. What the heck is plan B? Coming up in the next episode, Gypsy asks Nicholas the question, will you kill my mother? Surprisingly, he says he can't do it. But even more surprisingly, he says Victor the vampire will do it. He was like, ask Victor, please. And I said, Victor, will you please come kill my mother for me? Because I can't do it myself. What happens when Nicholas, a.k.a. Victor the Vampire, rolls into town on a mission of murder? He was wearing a hoodie and dark clothing and a scary t-shirt that had evil clowns on it. And I handed him the knife. Now I want to take you through the murder scene minute by minute as the vampire killer does what he does. Now that's all coming up in episode four of The Killer Thorn of Gypsy Rose, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. And we're going to get a look at what actually took place inside that house that night because Gypsy was there for every minute of it. You won't want to miss her talking about what happened that night. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for listening.